Well, that's an easy question to answer. The Putney debates, um, unlike the execution of Charles I, have actually received much more attention in the last two or three decades, because in one sense, for modern people, the Putney debates look quite similar to what happens in the modern world. Groups of people discussing uh, what is legitimate, what's good uh, practice in terms of representation, what government is for. The unique thing about Putney was these were ordinary men. We always have to remember women didn't really participate. These were the radical soldiers of the new model army who in the autumn of 1647 had gathered at Putney at the request both of the soldiers but also of the grandees, the higher up soldiers, to debate what are we going to do with the king. So this is in the midst of civil wars and Parliament is trying to negotiate with the king a settlement that will pretty, pretty much keep things as they are, but stop the fighting. The radical soldiers, the levellers, the agitators of the new model army have lost blood in the wars. And it's their view that they need a settlement that attends to their needs. Some of that is just simple. They want to be paid. But others of it are, are really very modern looking. So Colonel Rainsborough, says that government should be for everybody, not just the wealthy, not just the property. And he has a famous um, statement that is still up in the church at uh, Putney that says, the poorest he in England has as much right to be involved in politics as the richest he in England. Now, we're lucky because we have a transcript of the discussions that took place there and we can hear the different voices. We can even... You know, look at um, men who didn't contribute sitting on the edge, sort of wondering what was going on. And we know that the Putney debates wasn't simply an expression of modern democratic theory. They did talk about equal rights, they talked about consent and popular sovereignty, but they were a little bit obsessed with franchise because we need to remember that this period is one, it's a very hierarchical world. And, you know, we, we'd have real issues if today we decided that if you were on benefits, you weren't going to get to vote, or, I mean, we don't give prisoners the vote, or as we're celebrating th this anniversary, giving women the vote. This didn't really occur to many people in the 17th century um, because of their understandings of the gendered hierarchy. But the levellers were the most radical group within Putney, and they advanced something called the Agreement of the People, which was a, a sort of proto-constitution that wanted to open up, empower more people, independent people, who were very worried about servants, because the fear was if you were somebody's servant, you'd vote in the way your master told you. And th there's a lot of toing and froing. We should also recognise that within that group, the so-called grandees, the, the generals of the new model army, are absolutely panicked about there being too much, as they call it, popularity. And they don't mean, you know, going on a game show. They mean too many people. Armed groups of people are known as mobs. They're not communities. So th there's a real tension between those um, two positions. But out of Putney comes an entire range of printed literature. And that those agreements of the people are revised published, distributed. There are the heads of proposals from the, the more elite generals. They're circulated. And we can see that event feeding into a sort of discursive tradition. And certainly Cromwell and some of the generals were very, very anxious because at the same time as they're dealing with this, they're trying to negotiate with the king. And it's the easiest thing for the royalists to say, look, you know, the new model army, it's full of lunatics. They all want to give servants the vote and all sorts of stuff. So Cromwell, in essence, and the army grandees has the radical elements of Putney put down subsequently in the summer. They call for, you know, let's disperse all these soldiers gathering at Putney talking politics. Let's call them back to be um, you know, gathered in their troops. And if the radical ones turn up with pamphlets, we'll, we'll shoot them. And that's pretty much, it was, Burford was the famous sort of event where levellers were killed. 
So Put- Putney is a key part of our uh, democratic tradition, but we've got to be really cautious when we go back and look at their languages. Remember, overwhelmingly, they were religious figures and they believed in equity. That, that comes from God. Everybody is equal because we all have reason and it's a facility given to us by God. This is sounds perfectly normal to us today, but it's an absolutely horrific thought to a world where there is ordered hierarchy and where people, in the famous words that we still hear, you know your place. You're a servant, you're a woman, you're a daughter. And what Putney symbolised was people, the people, taking control of politics for themselves. And you know, when we, we hear a lot today about the people have spoken, the worst thing you could probably say in the 17th century was invoke the people. Because for elite groups, the people were a mob. So a language they use quite a lot. And they're unruly. They're ungodly. They're violent. So the idea that popular consent could be legitimate and authoritative was a real problem. And Putney, Putney embodied that for them. <laughs> ¶¶ 